Thank you very much for inviting me here to argue. And uh, <clears throat> my disclaimer is I'm not a molecular biologist, so I'm not going to be able to argue the details of the methodology. But what I will do is look at it from a clinical perspective. And I'm going to talk about the decipher test that's being marketed currently for bladder cancer patients and uh, why it's not quite ready for prime time just yet. So in order to make my argument, I'm going to talk briefly about genomics and cancer in general. We'll talk about the use of genomics in uh, bladder cancer. We'll talk about the decipher test and the decipher test's use in bladder cancer. We'll talk about the evidence for uh, its use and the limitations of this evidence. And we'll briefly talk about cost. So there's little doubt that precision medicine is the future of oncology. Um, looking at a patient's expression profile and genetic profile to determine what treatments would be best for that patient. The problem is in neurologic malignancy, that science is lagging. So I know this is not a rigorous way to evaluate it, but if you did a PubMed search for mutational biology and you put in breast cancer, you'd get 475 citations. But if you did the same thing for bladder cancer, you'd only get 58. So just telling you how far we still have to go uh, in this field. That being said, uh, there have been publications that have looked at certain mutations and its correlation with outcomes with chemotherapy. The paper on the left is in Cancer Discovery in 2014, and this was a phase one trial of Everolimus uh, and Pazopinib in patients with advanced solid cell tumors. And what they noticed, that in bladder cancer patients with activating mTOR mutations, they responded extremely well. The figure on the right is from JAMA Oncology last year, and it looked at bladder cancer patients being treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, cisplatin-based, that uh, either did or did not have the ERCC2 mutation. And what they found is patients with the ERCC2 mutations responded far better than those who did not. That being said, only 40% of patients with that, that responded to the chemotherapy had that mutation. So the majority of patients that responded to chemotherapy uh, were ERCC2 negative. So the applicability of this uh, remains to be determined. So in general, single gene mutations is probably not the way to go because it only takes into account uh, one aspect and doesn't uh, look at uh, the complex genetic interactions that one might have in malignancy and would only be applicable to a small subset of patients. So the Decipher Bladder Test, which is currently approved, and you could order this if you wanted, uh, is marketed for patients who are candidates for cystectomy. And it looks at mRNA expression in 149 genes. And what it does is it breaks down uh, the patients into four bladder molecular subtypes, luminal, luminal infiltrated, basal, and basal clot in low. And when they looked at the response to chemotherapy, um, they found that the basal types had improved survival with neoadjuvant chemotherapy compared to radical cystectomy patients with the basal type who did not receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Now, this was not a randomized trial. These were two separate groups of patients. And the data for the decipher test comes mostly from this paper published in European Urology in March of this year. And it's an excellent paper. And what they did is they looked at whole transcriptome profiling on 343 TOR specimens, and they classified these tumors into the four molecular subtypes that I mentioned. Using um, the profile information, they developed the genomic subtyping classifier to predict subtypes in the context of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. They let, then looked at overall survival according to subtype and compared it to a separate group of patients, 476 patients, who did not receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy. They also looked at the ability of the test to predict the subgroups, so the, the accuracy of the test to predict the subgroups. And they got a reasonable accuracy of 73% with an area under the curve of 0.85. That being said, that is the accuracy of the test to predict subtype, not the accuracy of the test to predict response to chemotherapy, which is what clinicians really need to know to make a decision on the utility of a test. So what are the limitations of the study? Well, the original classification was not meant to be based on outcomes. It was just based on RNA expression profiles. 
Further, it was developed mostly in cystectomy patients, later translated to TUR specimens, but uh, again, originally developed uh, subclassification in cystectomy patients. And these were originally patients who did not receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And although the basal group performed better um, uh, after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, interestingly, there was no association with major response to chemotherapy. So they did not have a higher rate of pathologic T0, for example, which is unusual. Also, the publication doesn't tell us what is the positive predictive value or negative predictive value of that test for response to chemotherapy, because that's what clinicians need to know. And finally, they only looked at uh, response to cisplatin-based chemotherapy, uh, not any of the other treatments which are uh, available. Also, what's important to know is what is the number needed to test? So how many patients do I have to run this test on for it to be useful? Uh, well, in the original publication, the basal subtype comprised only 30 to 35 percent of patients. Not all basal subtypes will respond to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And as previous studies have shown, not every patient who may otherwise have been candidate for neoadjuvant chemotherapy receives it because of either renal insufficiency, medical comorbidity, or patient refusal. Further, no, there's no consensus on the molecular subtyping that the decipher test currently uses. And actually, this paper in Cell just two months ago divides bladder cancer into five molecular subtypes, which includes a neuronal type. And this nice review in European Urology, again, very recently, stated that it should be emphasized that our understanding of the biological and clinical properties of the molecular subtypes of bladder cancer is still fairly limited. And we do not yet know whether the molecular subtype membership is a stable, intrinsic feature of a given tumor. In other words, is it the same over time or after treatment, or does it change? Also, this paper in Journal of Pathology says that molecular subtyping alone is probably insufficient, and you probably should combine that with immunohistochemical information. Also, we should not use these tests in isolation. Uh, what we need to do is build composite risk models that help us determine uh, and make clinical decisions. So this would allow us to capture the complex interdependent interactions between distinct gene mutations. And these composite risk models would include clinical factors, germline polymorphism, disease-related alterations such as proteome and metabolome information, as well as microenvironment-related factors such as cytokines and infiltrating immune cells. And this will allow us to determine what additional benefit that test has over what we currently have clinically available. And that information is what we need to determine the utility of a test. The original study uh, validated this subclassification uh, in a group of patients, just under 100 patients. And we know that validating in a single cohort is probably inadequate. Uh, it needs to be prospectively validated. It needs to be looked at in a wide variety of patients to ensure that the algorithm is robust across a range of different patient populations. Also, we need to take into account the potential genetic drift that occurs with treatment. So would this have to be retested multiple times? Also, we have to make sure that the, te the validation test was adequately powered. This uh, nice figure in a uh, publication in Blood uh, shows uh, and helps us determine if a validation study was adequately powered based on the observed hazard ratio, the number of events seen, as well as the fraction of positive cases. So if you do this for the validation study of the Decipher publication, you know, it falls in this area, which suggests that it may have been underpowered. And the authors acknowledge that. Also, what about tissue sampling? Uh, DNA, RNA from paraffin-embedded TOR specimens may be fragmented or chemically modified. TOR specimens may not fully represent the spatial heterogeneity and clonal hierarchies of the disease as a whole. Also, uh, in parallel to prognostic models and tests, we need to develop therapeutics in bladder cancer, which is lacking. And so the development of uh, you know, patient selection needs to move in parallel with these therapeutic developments. Finally, I'll talk briefly about cost and the outrageous cost of these genetic tests. This nice article in the New York Times from a few years ago talked about the cost of the 
testing for BRCA1 mutation and how patients in society and our healthcare system will pay for these expensive tests. And although cost effectiveness for the use of Decipher in bladder cancer has not been performed, it has been performed in a publication recently uh, in prostate cancer. So they used the Markov model and assumed a assay cost of $4,000. And they compared its use uh, to help in the decision-making post-prostatectomy to decide if patients were going to receive adjuvant radiation or not. And they compared it to a scenario where 100% of patients received adjuvant radiation, which is far from what is currently being practiced. And they demonstrated that if you did that, you'd demonstrate an uh, average cost uh, savings of $11,400. But if you compared it to usual care, in which only 7% of men receive adjuvant radiation, you only get a benefit of 24 days quality-adjusted lifetime which would translate into a cost of $90,000 um, for each quality-adjusted life year, which is above the threshold of $50,000, which is generally accepted as cost-effective. And the test would have to be less than $1,500 to satisfy that threshold. Also, we have to take into account biases that could exist in publications. Uh, this article in JAMA from several years ago showed that if a study is funded by a for-profit organization, it was five times more likely to recommend that treatment uh, compared to not pro uh, publications and studies funded by not-for-profit organizations. And so we just need to take that into account. And the study did have a few disclosures to mention. So in summary, the classification system that the Decipher test uses was not developed for therapeutic guidance. Molecular classification is evolving and has already been shown to be changing over time, and so we're not sure if the classification currently used by the test is still valid. It has also not been validated prospectively or in large, diverse populations, and we don't know the performance characteristics of that test, and we need that information as clinicians to decide if it is useful to us. Also, information from uh, the G GCS needs to be added to composite risk models so we could determine how much additional information it actually provides to see if it's worth the added cost of the test. And, of course, as I mentioned, we need to continue to develop therapeutics in bladder cancer so we have uh, more target, uh, tools in our armamentarium to use this information. And finally, it hasn't been shown to be cost effective. So the, probably the strongest argument for not using this test today is the concluding statement from the publication that helped develop the test. And they state, these findings require prospective validation before this single sample classifier can be used in clinical practice. So although our understanding of bladder cancer is improving over time, I think it's still just the tip of the iceberg. Thank you.